Do you guys remember when you first learned about a new gaming franchise? I'll personally never forget how I learned about Shulk in Smash 4. Who the hell is that? That Shulk. Who? The main character from Xenoblade Chronicles. What? He's budget Link but with a British accent. Now you've got my attention. The Nintendo Wii was one of the biggest changes and in innovators the gaming industry has ever seen. It gave us motion controls, grander games than we had ever seen in popular franchises, more motion controls, games to bring people together and enjoy as a family, and even more fucking motion controls. The Wii was a big part of many younger folks' childhoods and even people who don't play very many video games at all have at least played Wii Sports. It has one of the greatest libraries of games ever and has some of my personal favorite games of all time. I mean, my favorite game ever, Skyward Sword, is on the Wii, so that automatically makes me defend it to death. Many popular franchises had their biggest and best games in their series to date during the Wii era, and even some lesser-known franchises exploded onto the scene. Unfortunately, moving into the later years of the Wii, many games didn't get the publicity or promotion they deserved and got overshadowed by the upcoming Wii U. Imagine getting less promotion than the worst branded console ever. That's an accomplishment. And one game that may have suffered the most was an RPG that was originally released in 2010 but didn't make its way to the PAL regions until 2011, and not to North America until 2012, the same year the Wii U was released. Because of this late release date and low stock and sales, it has become incredibly rare and can be upwards of $100 in some places. But luckily, Nintendo realized this game deserved to be played by more people and gave it a much needed remaster on the Nintendo Switch in 2020. And I mean much needed. I'm a massive RPG fan, most of you guys know that already, so it's a no-brainer what my feelings are on this game. So let's take a look and see why this game was worthy of a remake that everyone should play. Today, we are taking a look at Xenoblade Chronicles. Xenoblade Chronicles was released for the Wii in 2010 in Japan, 2011 in PAL regions, and 2012 in North America as I mentioned earlier. It got a port for the 3DS in 2015 that I feel like no one talks about even though it's pretty good, and now it has a much grander full remaster for the Nintendo Switch. Because the game was very exclusive early in its life and didn't make its way to other regions until late in the Wii era, it didn't sell or become wildly popular for a good amount of years. I personally had never even heard of the game until a certain YouTuber decided to do a playthrough of it in 2014. One of the pioneers of Let's Playing and still one of the best to this day, Chugga Conroy introduced me and from what I can see online, many others to this game with his playthrough. He definitely isn't the only reason the game gained popularity, but I definitely feel he at least deserves some recognition. Because of him, I ended up renting the game after seeing such good things about it and I wanted to play it before I watched his series to avoid getting spoiled. And if you watched my top 10 favorite games video, you know I enjoyed the hell out of this game. But I only played through it once before returning it, so its ranking in that video was a little bit of a guess because I didn't experience it as much as some of the other games. I knew I really liked the game, but it had been 5 years since I'd played it and wasn't too sure how it stacked up to the others. So I kinda just threw it near the bottom of the list with the intention of replaying it with the remake to give it a real placement. And after playing the remake, where does it rank now? Quite a bit higher. Before I go into a single detail about this game, I want you all to know that this video will contain heavy spoilers, so I do highly recommend playing the game for yourself first if you don't want the story spoiled for you. I will start by solely talking about the gameplay and world exploration first, so you can still listen to that if you're interested. I will give you a warning before I do start talking about the story, but that's going to be the majority of this video. And once I start talking about it, I ain't stopping for anyone, so continue at your own risk. Xenoblade is an open world RPG which should immediately tell you a few things. It's got a good story and characters, battles to give you experience to level up, and most importantly, a bunch of random side quests that take up about 70% of the game. The vast majority of this game that you actually play is exploring the open areas on the Bionis looking for any random NPC to fulfill their requests. This is something I always praise about RPGs because adding actual substance to a game that makes it last longer is always a plus in my book, as long as the side quests aren't constant backtracking and delivery quests. Those can go f*** themselves. If you really tried to and didn't complete a single side quest in this game, you probably could complete it in like 10 hours even with no speedrun tactics. But I said the same thing about Final Fantasy VII. Why the hell are you playing an RPG if you aren't going to do the side quests? I will admit, some can be quite tedious when it's just go defeat 5 of a random enemy or find this random item on the ground, but the ones that force you to explore the region to an extent you never would if you were solely completing the main story, those are fantastic. The Bionis is beautiful, everyone can agree on that, but actually getting to see the entire world and how grand the 
the scope of the game truly is, that's what makes this game stand out. I will always put a lot of focus on side quests and character interactions because they make the game much more memorable to me rather than just battling and storming through the game as quickly as possible. And speaking of battling, the fighting in this game is both similar and quite different from many RPGs you may have played. When you think of fighting in a video game, what do you expect it to be like? Maybe turn-based, or maybe just mashing buttons to beat the shit out of the enemy? Well, take those ideas, crumple them up, throw them in the trash, and hit yourself in the head because Xenoblade is nothing like that. What if I told you the main basic fighting mechanic in this game is literally doing nothing? You'd probably think the game was f***ing trash, but I promise it actually works. Yes, your basic attacks are done automatically with no input required, but I actually kind of like that. This lets you focus more on your arts attack to strategically take down the enemy instead of just looking like you're jacking off your controller. Every party member has their own weapon and fighting style which allows for a lot of customization for your team by switching quickly between allies before any fight. Personally, I always play a Shulk just because his arts are the most important in my eyes, but it's up to the player to pick how they want to play. Although I do play as a different character in the first two chapters of the game and the last few chapters for reasons. I really do love that even though this is one of the simplest fighting mechanics in any game I've ever played, it's also more enjoyable and well thought out than it gets credit for. For doing absolutely nothing, the fighting in this game is more engaging than most RPGs out there. If only other games could take inspiration, but instead we get stuff like, oh f I am now going to delve into the story, so if you want to avoid spoilers, click off the video right now, this is going to be your last warning. Is everyone gone? Perfect. This game follows the classic anime arc where it starts off peaceful with a girl bringing food to her crush as they sit out and enjoy the view. And at the end of the game, you kill God. How this game went from Shulk eating a sandwich all the way to fighting a god who wants to kill all life and restart the world to keep himself in full control? My brain is doing somersaults just trying to connect the dots. I have so many questions, but most importantly, who puts herbs and spices on a fucking sandwich? The dialogue so obviously points to Fior cooking curry or chili or something like that, especially considering her brother is eating it out of a bowl with a a spoon, but five minutes later after she delivers the same food to Shulk, he's just eating a sandwich! Where did the curry go? Also, she was delivering it to Shulk quickly so it wouldn't get cold, but who even makes a warm plain turkey sandwich? Nothing adds up, and worst of all, they didn't even animate Shulk taking bites out of the sandwich! He's clearly not eating it and just pretending to make Fiora happy, but she's literally sitting one foot away from him so she can tell he's not eating it she says nothing! This scene makes no fucking sense, god damn it! <sighs> Okay, I just needed to get that out of my system. Because if we're being honest, this is the only scene in the game with any problems, so I need to make a big deal out of it since the rest are damn near perfect. The game starts by giving you a background of this world showing two titans, the Bionis and the Mechonis, dueling before they both enter a dormant sleep. We then jump into a battle between the Homs who live on the Bionis and the Mechon from the Mechonis. This really is the game's way to teach you how the gameplay works as well as show you how deadly this conflict has gotten. Also to show Mumkar being killed. I'm sure he won't come back later. A year passes and Shulk is trying to unlock the secrets of the Monada while Dunban is still recovering from the battle. And then Shulk totally doesn't eat the sandwich Fior gave him, but I will let this slide that one time. The first chapter of the game is really just exploring Colony 9 and doing as many side quests as you can while playing as Fior for as much time as possible for reasons. Ryan then asks for Shulk's help retrieving ether cylinders through Tefra Cave, and although Fior is afraid for Shulk, they go without her- Never mind. Can she teleport? That really would have come in handy in the next chapter. The three travel to the top before out of nowhere Mechon drop from the sky onto Colony 9 and start eating people. That got dark real quick. They head back to the colony to stop the Mechon before letting Fiora leave to take the cylinders to the broken artillery. Dunban then comes out of nowhere and starts slicing the Mechon to pieces. You literally couldn't even hold a spoon yesterday, and now you are helicoptering robots twice your size to death? Not even close to the most bullshit thing we see someone do in this game. Dunban eventually realizes he's still injured, so Shulk grabs the Monado and can magically see the future, allowing him to dodge and defeat the Mechon with ease. Really fortunate the main character has the most overpowered ability in the game, but I'm not complaining. They then come face to face with a faced Mechon who isn't weak to the Monado. Well, it's okay because Fiora has our back. What the f- I'm not even gonna try to sugarcoat it. I hate how much this game makes me fall in love with Fiora in like three hours of gameplay just to rip my heart out and laugh at me. This is one of two deaths in any video games I've played where I actually cried. Everyone knows the other because I'm a pussy when it comes to Final Fantasy VII. But Fiora is right up there right next to remake Aerith as my favorite girls in video game history. I felt the pure anger Shulk screamed with. Shulk's voice actor did such an incredible job throughout this scene. The whole game has an incredible voice cast. But Shulk is perfect in all these emotional scenes. Even though this scene 
scene is so heavy, well done, and I still hate it, it does set up the entire motivation for the main characters to start their journey. Most games have a story that revolves around trying to save the world or a love interest, and yes, this kind of has those aspects, but this game is truly a revenge story. Shulk and Ryan legitimately only leave because they want to kill the faced Mechon who killed Fiora to avenge her. You rarely see games like that, but it makes the story much more believable. Imagine if your best friend who you had feelings for was killed right in front of you all while you were getting visions of seeing it happen, but you couldn't do anything to stop it. Shulk feels like it's his fault she died and needs to get revenge for not being able to save her. Such a good motivation we rarely see. Ryan and Shulk head out and begin making their way up the Bionis, and pretty quickly they reach the greatest area music ever, Gar Plains. I could go on for a long time on why this song is amazing, but I have a whole video on video game music which talks about this theme. In fact, since we're talking about music, I'll just quickly say this game has either my favorite or second favorite soundtrack of all time. It's close between it and the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but the game has such a wide variety of songs, all of which are fantastic. There are some songs that are reused very often for cutscenes, but they really don't get repetitive since the songs always fit the scene. The game takes you all across the Bionis, meeting new people who all share a common goal of defeating the Mechon so they join your party. There's Sharla, the sniper with a great body but I can't look at her without staring at her massive mole, Dunban, Fiora's brother whose name is definitely not Duncan, Melia, the magic princess with family problems who every guy has the hots for, and the best of all, Hero Pon Ricky. In a game with people fighting robots, who would have guessed the best character is a fucking volleyball with a face wielding a giant hammer? This shouldn't make sense, but Ricky is legitimately one of, if not the best character in the game. On the surface, he looks like a comedy relief character added for children, but he's got so much more depth than that. That's one of the biggest strong points for this game. All the characters have development and personalities that are believable and deal with problems that strengthen those personalities. I say this about damn near every game I make a video on, but please give me characters that I can give a crap about to make the journey more meaningful. Imagine if Fiora was just some random girl who got killed. Shulk probably wouldn't have the anger-fueled rage to go kill all the mech on. I mean, he literally saw people getting eaten eaten in front of him, but he didn't go mental until Fiora was killed. Without their connection, this scene would be quite a bit less meaningful. And speaking of touching moments, the scene on Prison Island is fantastic. Again, if you want to avoid spoilers, then why the f*** are you this far into the video? Shulk is facing two-faced Mechon before one of them opens its body, revealing a person inside. And you have no idea how happy I was to learn that my wife is alive! The entire time I played this, I refused to believe Fiora was truly dead, I just wouldn't accept it. And they kind of hint at the Mechon being a human showing a woman being put inside it, but finally seeing proof it is Fiora made me so happy. And if one-faced Mechon was a hom, then I wonder who Metal Face is. I mean, it's not like there was a certain character who was killed at the beginning who used the same weapon, knows Dunban, and has the exact same voice. Yeah, after the Fiora reveal, Mumkar being alive just wasn't very surprising. My honest reaction was just, oh, that random dumb dick who fought with Dunban and was killed off screen is actually still alive? Okay. But the final scene when Shulk and Fiora are finally reunited after falling off the Titans, it is such a beautiful scene. Seeing the pure happiness on Shulk as Fiora finally recognizes him is so satisfying. Although I do wish their kiss wasn't cut a millisecond before it happened. It's still such an amazing reunion, even if Fiora is now like 80% robot. I mean, Shulk doesn't seem to complain and Ryan definitely doesn't complain. The only person who might complain about her being back is Melia. I mean, she was almost killed by her kind of sister, then watched her dad get stabbed by a 20-foot blade right in front of her and now her only love interest is reunited with the girl he actually has feelings for. Not to mention her entire race turns into Telethia, including her brother who they need to fight before he explodes, leaving her to lead the survivors of the race by herself. Poor Melia. I am so happy this game got an HD remaster for the Switch and I hope the definitive edition leads to more people experiencing this masterpiece. I love watching people's reactions to the touching moments and seeing Fiora die after they fall in love with her. Does that make me sadistic? Probably. Xenoblade is one of the greatest games ever made and anyone who hasn't played it needs to. The story, characters, and overall world to explore are easily some of the best you will ever experience, and the varying emotions you feel will leave an everlasting impression on you that you will never forget. Plus the music is so amazing. Not just Gar Plains, but every location, every battle, and every cutscene has a perfect theme to accompany it better than almost any game out there. And then of course the main theme is literally the greatest title theme to ever exist and no, I will not budge on this topic. Now I'm sure a lot of you are wondering where this now places in my top 10 favorite games after experiencing it again and fully appreciating the game? Well, I will say it is much, and I mean much closer to the top now, but I don't want to give away the exact position. I might make an updated top 10 in the future, so you can wait until that video inevitably comes out to see where it's placed. Maybe it'll be number one, or maybe you've watched my videos and know that's literally impossible. Xenoblade is a near-perfect game, and more games need to take inspiration from some of the ideas they came up with. The game has no flaws. 
Well, except for that goddamn sandwich. Who puts herbs and spices on a fucking sandwich?